Hi Tom, I'm a postgraduate student at UCL and I'm also one of the co-founders of um, Ubiquity Press. Um, and I'm just going to quickly, I'm sharing the presentation with Vicky. I'm not an archaeologist, I just said we need Vicky here. Um, I'm going to give a background to Ubiquity Press. I'm going to talk about why we felt open access was the right model for us and talk about briefly some of our publications. So um, I came from a career in biomedical publishing, and Brad Howell, one of the co-founders, came from a career in publishing uh, with Elsevier. Um, we subsequently came to UCL to do research degrees, um, and the more, the more closely we became involved with the research community, the more we felt that current publishers weren't meeting the needs of the researcher. We felt that re researchers were more seen as a revenue stream than actually people that were, you know, were being promoted. Um, so we initially began <coughs> publishing some journals through, through UCL, so papers from the Institute of Archaeology, um, and then grew into um, Ubiquity Press, and um, about a year ago we, we decided to expand from UCL, and um, that's kind of what we'll be talking about today. So why did we choose open access? Well, because um, progress and research is built on shared knowledge, so the knowledge needs to be out there. With the traditional publishing model, um, the author transfers copyright to the publisher, and then the publisher sells the content. And that may have worked with old technology, but it doesn't suit the technology that we have today. Um, it means that if you don't have the money, um, <coughs> then you know, if you're in a developing country, then you can't access the content. And I think it's pretty unethical to be stopping people accessing content when actually um, there's no good reason to be doing it. Um, yeah, and so if you don't have the money, you're, you're behind, you know, you're, you're on the wrong side of the wall. So in contrast, open access um, can break down barriers between disciplines. It means you can access content that you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to access. Um, I think it promotes public understanding and engagement if you get the information out. Uh, it means that with open licenses, people would start getting together uh, data and um, analyzing it and reusing it in ways that aren't possible under closed, closed licenses. Uh, and it maximizes the researcher um, sort of readership and impact. How do we fund it? Um, there are different models for, for funding open access publications, but we've decided to, to um, go down the route of uh, article processing charges. So this means that the publisher is paid for the, the actual work that we do. Um, our lack of legacy means that we can keep prices low. Um, we build into our model um, a way of giving waivers to researchers who are in countries that can't afford to pay processing charges. Um, and we understand that we need to be fair and, and transparent about our costs. I, th I think one of the really nice things about processing charges is that you can start comparing the costs of different journals and deciding whether one more expensive journal is really worth the extra money. Um, and we're seeing that now governments and funders are really um, getting behind open access. This is just one example from the Wellcome Trust. Um, they said that they're going to start withholding um, final grant, pay grant payments if researchers fail to make their, their content um, open access. So very briefly, our publications, we have um, some open access journals, several of which focus around archaeology. So um, we have the Bulletin of the History of Archaeology. We have um, we published the um, PIA, Papers from the Institute of Archaeology. We are developing an a, a, um, e-book platform which will be launched at the start of next year. And what interests me most is a meta journal platform that we've been developing. Um, and the meta journal platform, the idea is that we're um, making data and software accessible that would otherwise be isolated in silos. Um, Vicky's going to talk about this in a bit, but um, the content is peer-reviewed. Um, we focus on making data and software available that has high reuse potential. And um, we, through citation tracking of the papers we publish, we can incentivize um, openness of data and software and reward um, work that would otherwise go unnoticed, um, unrecognized. So the first uh, meta-journal, um, that we published is the Journal of Open Archaeology Data. This came uh, out of a project funded by uh, JISC um, called Reward, which is what Vicky will be talking about. You can look at this on the web, and so I'll, I'll let you take a look uh, if you're interested. But I think what's really important about the platform is 
Um, it has benefits to a very wide range of people. So as a researcher, people uh, working in research get career recognition through making their work available and getting citations. It uh, promotes collaboration uh, for the public. It means that you can go to things like Hack Days. I don't know whether people here go to Hack Days, but um, people can access data and start doing interesting things with, with data that was would un, um, otherwise be unavailable. Uh, it means the papers can be validated and lots of other stuff, um, which Vicky will talk about. So I'll hand over to Vicky. Okay, uh, just to warn you, I have got a really bad cough. So if I start spluttering, poor Tom will have to take over and listen to what I'm talking about. Um, Okay, so I'm the editor of the Journal of Open Archaeology Data. I've actually got a background in archaeology. I'm doing my PhD at the Institute at UCL. But I also am a data scientist for the Medical Research Council. So that's how I became interested in this project. Um, first off, just briefly, I'll talk about um, the Journal of Open Archaeology Data. Um, basically, it's researcher-led, so when we're getting researchers to come in and publish for us, really it's about what they want to be talking about. I'm not heading out saying, can you write about this? It's really them coming to us and saying, we've got this data, we'd like to get it out there. It's fully open access, peer-reviewed, so we do help throughout the entire process, um, making sure that the data and the actual information that's being published about that data match that they work. Um, and it's also aimed to be really quick. Um, we don't want papers sitting around for six months a year. Um, one of the benefits of being online is that we publish as and when papers um, are ready. We're not waiting for a particular issue of a journal to come out. And it's very, very quick and easy to do. Um, this actually makes it look almost more complicated than it is. All you have to do is register, <coughs> put your data in a repository, then you'll get a number, a citable reference for that, um, uh, for that data, so you can add that to your paper. You write your paper, submit it, we'll help you out with all of that, and then you add the paper's number, that DOI, to the repository. So basically, you have two ways that people can cite to you, through the data paper, which I'm about to talk about, and also you can actually cite the data that's in that repository. It has a particular number, and it is actually ref returnable. So what's a data paper? Well, it's a paper that's basically describing how you put all that data together, how that data set was created. It describes that data details what you could actually do, do with that data. Um, it's often authored by data scientists. It may not be the principal investigator from an entire project. It might be the person who's actually in charge of collecting and collating that data. So it's a very good way of people getting a paper who might not normally become first author on a paper. Um, and as I said, it's citable. So you can actually um, track who's using your data. Um, data. Data paper is not a research paper, so it's not designed to be a replacement for the main papers in the main journals that you would normally submit to. It is purely about that data. Um, and it's really the, it's, it's not to just replicate what information is there in a data repository. I don't know how many people of you, uh, people from the audience will have actually looked at a data repository, but often there'll be a very brief description of what the data is. That's usually not quite detailed <coughs> enough for anybody to go on to use that data properly, so this is really what this is about. It's about improving our understanding of the data that's already out there. As I mentioned, um, journal, we look at peer review quite seriously. And really, it's, an, it's more of a matter, it's not something to be frightened of, it's something about helping <coughs> researchers. Um, so it's ensuring that the methods section provides sufficient detail so that people can truly understand that data set, that it's properly described, um, and that there are really good suggestions for how that data could be reused. 
We also look at the deposited data, so we're not just interested in what we're publishing, we're also interested in the data that is being put in the repository. Um, so we're also checking that it's open access, just as the paper is, um, that it's in a format that people can use. One of the big problems is if you go into a repository, usually people are using Microsoft Excel or some other um, piece of software that people would need to have access to. Now, if you are from a resource poor part of the world, you may not be able to afford Microsoft Office, for example. And basically just making sure that everything is labelled, it's very easy to see um, that data and that it's actually, you can open it. So that's a brief overview of the actual journal. I just want to talk to you a bit about the project that helped us to get it going. Um, it's called the Reward Project. And basically it's a collaboration between Ubiquity Press and UCL with funding from JISC. And it, took, it went over six months. And basically it was looking at getting um, academics going through the processes we saw it from collecting that data through to actually publishing a data paper and um, using a repository. In this case, we were using UCL Discovery as a test um, repository. And the idea was that it shouldn't be a burden on the academic. We're really looking at using, looking at how they worked and trying to integrate around them. So. We did provide tools. Um, we tried out the DMP online tool, which I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail here, but to help people with their data management. And also, looking at it as a way of automatically creating a report on a data management plan that could be submitted to funding organisations or other bodies that might be interested in how work was going to be disseminated at the end of the project. Um, then we help them with creating a data paper and with submitting data to a data set to a repository. To help with that, we had a couple of workshops at the Institute of Archaeology um, with a series of talks and also just getting people to talk about their own concerns, what issues they saw coming up, um, and also just doing a general, we did a general survey throughout the Institute to find out what people's attitudes were to this idea. As part of the project though, we also looked specifically at seven case studies. So we followed seven projects um, that were either going to be finishing during the six month period or preferably actually were during the, you know, um, they were collecting data throughout those six months from start to finish. And we tried to cover a reasonable range across the types of data um, that can be collected. So we had projects in GIS, archaeological material science, history of archaeology, and also heritage management, which encompasses things like visual data and also quantitative data. <coughs> but what did we find? Well, <coughs> some, some of the sort of negative things. Um, a lot of the researchers, when we were talking to them, were unfamiliar with the types of data that there were, the <coughs> formats that they could actually publish data in. Um, a lot of them had never really considered how they were going to ever archive their data long term or how that, that was going to be funded. And there were also concerns, um, a lack of understanding of issues relating to property rights and also to data protection. <coughs> However, more positively, a lot of people just did not like the idea of permanently discarding their data. They wanted to see it being used, not sitting in a shoebox in a garage somewhere. Um, and <coughs> that. Um, there was a general feeling that a lot of people felt that you had to be constantly collecting new data. Um, there's a certain sense that there's a lack of reuse of old data. And certainly, I'm a human remains specialist, and I know that any PhD student, they'll start off and they'll go and collect all the same data as somebody else did from the same skeleton a couple of years before, and that will have been done for the last few decades. Big problem at the Museum of London, which is why they have a wonderful database there called the Word Database. 
Another issue was when looking at things like um, the section that says what reuse potential does this data have, people were very puzzled, found it very difficult to look from a broader perspective at their data, how other people could, might be able to use it. And there were some questions about the long-term value of certain types of data. Um, so for example, people working in heritage management, looking at the social side of things, some were saying it's very short-term um, relevant to this year, maybe for another couple of years, but otherwise it's going to be really perhaps just of historical interest. Um, I'd argue that historical interest might actually be good enough to warrant um, wanting to retain that type of data. But the major thing was that there was generally great willingness to share. Across the Institute, people were very keen on the idea of being able to share their data with other people, and that they felt that citations were an adequate incentive. They didn't need lots of other little sort of things to try and get them to do these papers. Just knowing that they're going to get their data cited properly was an adequate thing. Um, just briefly, um, there were some issues that we came up with that helped us um, when we were looking at creating these data journals. Um, we were looking at reducing, you know, people worried about time constraints, so that was one of the main things behind designing our processes. Um, there are concerns about legal issues, um, <coughs> particularly when you're looking at things like photographs. If you're working in heritage management, then uh, you might be taking images showing uh, protection, people going against protection conservation legislation. So, you know, should this be publicly accessible? Um, other things we had to look at, again, lack of belief in the broad relevance. Um, a lot of people just don't see how other people might be interested in what they do. And again, as I said about um, intellectual property rights and things, providing guidance about um, the effect of that. So we basically, we fed back information to UCL and to the department. Um, about some of the things that might be useful if they're trying to get their researchers to um, provide their data. Um, so looking at web pages, <coughs> providing lots of information about repositories and things, induction seminars that perhaps universities <coughs> should consider having specialist TA positions to help train and talk through these things with researchers. There's a major issue that there must be specific resource allocation for data curation. Um, and we also fed back to some of the, reposit the repositories we want to work with, and also to the DMP tool creators. So just to finish, <coughs> I'd like to a little bit, these are the benefits, as Tom mentioned. Um, there are lots of public benefits, um, particularly where uh, research is actually being publicly funded, it should be open access. For the researcher, most importantly, there's citations, there's career recognition, and the opportunity to have lots of new collaborations. Um, in fact, sometimes one of our papers has actually had a um, television company has, has rung up the researcher because of a paper they saw in our journal. And for the research community, of course, that means that we're retaining data. It's not ending up in someone's garage, mouldering away. So, as Tom said, this is the journal, and <coughs> that's the web page. Uh, just a little bit more. Since we launched the journal, um, we've added impact story. So you can actually not only see how many times you've been cited, but you can also look at Facebook likes, Mandalay, readers, tweeting. And we've had some very nice feedback. Um, here we've got Stuart Dunn talking about how he could use data in the class. It was very easy to use. Um, he's having to explain to his students this isn't normal. And how it would be so much better if this was the normal way of getting hold of data. Okay, so here are the detailed contact details. Um, any questions? Thank <laughs> you.